Excellent. Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our uh, curator tour of the Dorsky at 20, Reflections on a Milestone. I am here in the gallery with the exhibition, but you'll be able to see these artworks up close because uh, Amy uh, will, will uh, uh, present a slideshow while Wayne and her are speaking. I'm Zachary Bowman. I'm the Manager of Education and Visitor Experience here at the museum, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to my esteemed colleagues and curators of this exhibition, Wayne Lemka, who is the Art Collections Manager, former Interim Director here at the Dorsky, and Amy Fredrickson, our Exhibitions Coordinator at the Dorsky. Um, I'm not going to speak any more than that. Because uh, if you put a microphone in front of me, normally I'll just keep going. And most of you know, if you know me. Uh, and really, you're here to hear from Wayne and Amy. So thank you for being here. If you have questions during their talk, please put them in the chat. Um, we we'll also will leave time afterwards for you to ask questions directly of Wayne and Amy. Um, so welcome, thank you for being here and enjoy. Thank you, the SAC. All right. So I'll um, share my screen. Amy, it looks great. I think you want to go. Yep, totally. A bit slow. <laughs> Perfect. Looks great. You want to begin with a little bit about the permanent collection? Yeah. So, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it, it's. I hope you will all come to see the exhibition in person. But this is a really a great way to see the exhibition and get some more information than perhaps you might get if you're walking around. But Amy and I did work on chat labels for many of the exhibitions. I mean, many of the works in the exhibition. So there's uh, a lot of information there if you so desire when you come to, to read. So today we're going to talk a little bit about not all the works in the exhibition, because some of them we need to save for you when you come to be surprised and, and awed at what is there. Um, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our permanent collection and the, this exhibition before we, um, before we look more formally at, at some of the artworks. Uh, the Dorsky Museum has a permanent collection of uh, close to about 7,000 objects now. Um, we have, it runs the whole gamut from ancient Greek, Roman, Egyptian, right through the 20th first century. And we have a, a nice selection from almost every time period in the history of art. So again, like we say, our collection is pretty much encyclopedic. The majority of the collection has been donated by very generous individuals. And this 20th century, I mean, this 20th anniversary exhibition highlights, uh, again, a selection of very generous individuals who have made gifts or promised gifts to the museum in honor of our 20th uh, anniversary. And this exhibition will change again in January or in February when we open for the spring season. Some of the, some of the works will stay, but more works will, will, will come in. And uh, so we'll, we'll keep it lively because there are a lot of very generous individuals. And that's what help us, helps us to build our collection. So Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you. So um, this, as we were saying, is part of a two-part series. So this is the first part, and some several of the works will um, switch out with new works in the spring semester. And we use this as an opportunity. This is our 20th anniversary year, and so it's an opportunity to expand our collection and also um, continue the celebration throughout the whole year. And we're also it also coincides with our um, annual gala as well. And this is an opportunity for us to honor the people who donate and as a way to expand the collection for our students and visitors as well. So let me just talk about this um, bust that you see here. Um, this is a bust of Sam Dorsky, who was the, uh, 
who made the lead gift in 1994 to the SUNY New Paltz Foundation, which allowed us to begin fundraising to build the Samuel Dorsky Museum as it is today. And without um, Sam Dorsky's lead gift, we probably would not have had a museum. Originally, we were the College Art Gallery, and I believe we opened the College Art Gallery in 1964. And when the Art Gallery opened in 1964 on campus, we were the first SUNY college or university to have an art space for the public. But we have now transformed, thanks to the Dorsky gift and to the Dorsky's family's ongoing support into the second largest um, university art museum in the SUNY system. So Sam was a, a great supporter. Unfortunately, he died in 1994, so he never got to see the uh, museum open. But like I said, his four children have been very generous in the past with, and still continue to be very generous with supporting the museum. Um, briefly, um, a lot of people say, well, how did Sam Dorsky make his money or where did his money come from? Um, Sam did not have a lot of money when, um, in the beginning of his life, but he was the founder of a children's clothing line, and some of you might remember this, called Gray Animals. And that was a clothing line that was very popular in the 1970s and I think early 80s, where the child's shirt would have a giraffe and the child's pants would have a giraffe. So in the morning, you could say to your kid, go put on giraffes, and then everything would match. And that was a real, that became very popular. And that's where Sam made a lot of his money. And then he went on to open up an art, art gallery. He bef befriended many, um, many artists um, and showed their work in his gallery in New York City. His children have carried on that tradition today in Long Island City. So we were lucky to receive um, four works by Thomas Benjamin Pope, who lived in Newburgh, New York, and was very active during the 1870s. He painted, he was considered a late contributor to the Hudson River School. However, he painted, um, he was quite well known at the time. So during the 1870s, he opened up his studio also in Newburgh, where he was able to engage with students and visitors and he continued teaching. He was particularly interested in the relationship between the land and the sky. So in many of his works, he he's able to um, play with his light source. And this is one example of the four that are in the exhibition. And this is from um, Fishkill Landing. So quite local. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Andre Cortez. We have uh, two works by him in the exhibition. Again, um, coming to us from a very generous individual, Howard Greenberg, who has been a longtime supporter of the museum. Andre Cortez is really an interesting character. Uh, he was born in Hungary. Uh, he lived part of his life in Paris, France, and he died in, in the United States. And I always tell my students when I teach about Andre Cortez and many other photographers that you never know where life is going to lead you because at the university in Budapest, he studied economics. He went on to become a stockbroker in Hungary and then decided that this was something he did not want to do. And today we know him not as a stockbroker or an economist, but we know him as a very famous uh, 20th century photographer. This work in the exhibition on the wandering violinist um, is from the early part of his career where he's beginning to explore this idea of capturing and celebrating uh, ordinary uh, circumstances in life, celebrating the, the lyrical. And he certainly does that quite well in this, um, th th this very simple but very wonderful photograph. Our second image that we have by him in the exhibition um, called uh, From the Seine from Lady Mandela's apartment in Paris really shows more of his mature style that he developed and then brought to the United States. Andre Cortez became one of the first photographers to begin to point the camera um, at the world from different angles and he began to exploit overhead vantage points and this is a great example of photographing from above looking down. And what that does in many of the photographs is it makes the three-dimensional space become a bit two-dimensional. And you might say today, well, we don't have any issues with pointing the camera up or down. But when Andre Cortez was working in the, uh, the 1910s, 1920s, 
photographers were very limited in how they used the camera angle. So he was one who began to promote um, promote unethical or un unusual camera angles, I should say. So this is a great example of his mature style that, that he used. So works by Todd, Todd Webb, another um, well-known um, American photographer. He spent a lot of time in Harlem in the 1930s and 1940s. This is from his Harlem series, which was a very celebrated series at the time. Today, when we look at these photographs, we, we do see a, uh, we do see a Harlem from the past, but again now, if you've been to Harlem recently in the past um, five or 10 years, you see that Harlem is again going through a renaissance and it's kind of a, ha a happening place to be. So, uh, you know, you can get off on the train at 121st Street, I think that is, and um, you're right in the heart of Harlem and it's, it's really a great place to visit. But Tom, Todd Webb was doing some wonderful recordings of Harlem in, in the 1930s and 1940s. Aaron Siskin, another photographer um, who life led him in many directions. Um, originally in his life, he was an English teacher in a New York City high school for many, many years. Today, we know him as a very famous American photographer. This is also from a series that he did in Harlem in the 1930s. And this series really, I think, propelled his, his, his fame uh, in the world of photography. He also is very well known for abstract photographs where he simply focuses on um, lines that have been repaired in roadways or um, signage on, um, on billboards that are beginning to fade away or, or peel away. And he focuses up on these ordinary, ordinary objects and again creates a very abstract photograph. Austin Mecklen, um, this is a great photograph that we, I mean, a great painting that we have uh, by Austin Mecklen, a very well-known um, American painter from the Woodstock colony. And th this image is a little lighter than the painting when you see it in person. It's called 6 a.m. It is very dark, it's very mysterious. Um, Mecklen here uses a palette that colors that he became very well-known for later on in his career. He's painted this from a bird's eye point of view, which was something that he did quite often later in his painting career. And there's a lot of little interesting points here, um, clues here for the viewer to discover. Like in the bottom um, right-hand corner, there's a man going off to, we assume, work at the factory over on the left. And there's a little dog that leads him. There are clothes on a clothesline in, in, in the middle ground. And then in the background, we have water and we have, which could be the Hudson River. Um, we have other buildings in the background. So he does create a very mysterious environment using a, a bird's eye point of view. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, Amy, um, there is, this is something that art historians like to do is to make connections to things in the past or things in, in, that were done afterwards. And I know that many of you probably know the painting Nighthawks by Edward Hopper, which you now see on the corner of your screen. Although our painting done by Mecklen was painted before Hopper did um, Nighthawks, I know from research that Mecklen was showing his paintings in New York City and 6 a.m. at the same time that Edward Hopper was in New York City. So I've made this connection that perhaps Edward Hopper was a bit influenced or inspired by Mechlin's 6 a.m. to paint Nighthawk. So that's something that needs more research, but I think it's an interesting connection to think about. So you all can think about that, debate it or not, and, and go from there. Leslie Dill, um, another very well-known American and actually international artist. She was the subject of our um, 2002 Hudson Valley Artist Series, which is, a, which is a program that we do periodically where we feature very well-known artists who happen to live in the Hudson Valley. And Leslie Dill was one of the artists that we featured in our second Hudson Valley Artist Exhibition, um, as I mentioned. Even back in 2002, she was, she was very interested in combining words um, and pictures together. She publicly writes that she was inspired by her father, um, who 
heard voices and who also spoke other languages that he made up. So uh, growing up, she was always very much influenced by language, whether it be a documented language or a language that was a very private um, experience. So in this, in this um, print that she, she donated to us, you, you see, again, her use of words, her use of language. It might be hard to see, but there are interesting pieces of thread um, that she also includes in the, um, the, uh, on the print. So um, when you come to see the exhibition, you'll notice that there are loose threads on both the right and left-hand side that add, I think, to the mysteriousness of this, of this work. So here we have a, an example of not only looking, but reading becomes quite important when um, viewing an artwork. Someone said to me early on, um, why did you include a poster in this exhibition? Because our poster is really artwork. Well, this is a really, this is such a great poster to have in our collection. It's the poster from the International Exhibition of Modern Art, which was also known as the Armory Show, uh, which as you can see was in New York City um, from February 15th to March 15th, 1913. And this is the original, one of the original posters advertising uh, that international art exhibition. This exhibition was so important for American viewers who were very much, very much um, comfortable with viewing realistic artwork. Because this exhibition, as you can look at the names, included a lot of artists who were beginning to change the way we, we make art. Um, there was a lot of abstract art in this exhibition. And that was the first time that American audiences really got to see new and unique and avant-garde work that was happening in Europe. Their work was so controversial in some circles that a critic at the New York Times wrote an editorial that compared a lot of the artwork in this exhibition to what it might look like to witness an explosion in a roof shingle factory, you know, where all of a sudden all these roof shingles are blown up in the air. And that's how um, he and many people were viewing a lot of the modern art in this exhibition. But today, you know, we look at a lot of these works um, by these artists and they're very calm and serene and we don't feel that same kind of um, controversy that Americans felt in 1913. So it's a great poster to have in our collection. It's also interesting that um, in this exhibition, as the names are listed below on the poster, we are also able to include a Cezanne, a Renoir, and also a Matisse, which is, right. which yeah. who are also on, exhibit at this show. Yeah. So this um, photograph is by the artist Cindy Sherman and it's called Ancestor. And Cindy Sherman explore, likes to explore how self-portraiture is portrayed um, through photography. And so she takes the photos of herself and this is her dressed up as a biblical figure. And she disguises herself, you know, in her photograph. So originally most people didn't realize that this was in fact her. So she likes to explore how the photographer tells the truth to the, to the visitor, to the viewer. And um, she has many photos where she dresses up as biblical figures or, um, you know, different actors or people who, characters from movies and she disguises herself in the photographs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just um, join in also, Amy, with um, Cindy Sherman. She was, I think, one of the first photographers who really became a more formalized performance artist because here she's performing in front of the camera. And as Amy said, she has, over the course of, I don't know, 35 years, she's used herself constantly as the subject in her photograph. So every Cindy Sherman photograph you see, it is actually Cindy Sherman being somebody else. And Amy mentioned a few of her series. She did a great series of what she called Park Avenue Dames, you know, those women who live on Park Avenue. And I hope none of you are Park Avenue Dames, but you know, she does a really interesting commentary on those women who live um, on Park Avenue and just like to do social things. And she really and she really captures that, that essence of, of those people. And one other thing I just wanna say about Cindy Sherman too is for so many years when she was creating these photographs, she worked by herself. 
she was everybody. She was a photographer. She was the, uh, the, the, the director. She was a producer. She was the subject. So she likes that quietness. And I met her once and I have to say that while her photographs are really like, wow, and like a lot of them are like pizzazz, she was so quiet and unassuming that you would say, are you really Cindy Sherman? Because she portrays herself so different in, in so many of her photographs. So a great addition, as Amy said, to our collection. So these two works, oh, so we were also lucky enough to receive a small collection of works by Mary Frank. So we included two in this exhibition. Um, both are themes that Mary Frank has explored throughout her long career. Um, on the left is Persephone, and then on the right um, is uh, the natural history with the blue horse. And both, the, both of these themes show up in her work over and over the decades, whether it's in prints and paintings or in sculpture. And we were very lucky to receive this collection um, for the show. And next spring, we're actually going to be having um, a Mary Frank exhibition. It's gonna be a retrospective and um, it's part of our Hudson Valley Masters series. And so Mary Frank will be the subject of that exhibition and she is, um, very involved in the planning and there will be, she's also producing new artworks for um, that exhibition as well. And she has just a very interesting career and she's, her work is represented in many different museums like the Met, the Whitney, the Everson. And she just continues to evolve and to just produce so many different pieces. Andrew Light. Um... Andrew Light is in our um, collection. Uh, that was a promise gift to us. Are you hearing feedback? A little feedback. Okay, I wonder why. I, I think Amy Pickering needs to mute her computer. Oh. Okay, so and Andrew Light. Okay, so we'll try, well, good, I think it's much better. So um, Andrew Light, um, who is actually one of our honorees at our um, 20th anniversary gala on uh, October 9th. Um, he is a, a local artist, but he has a national and I, I believe international reputation. Um, he does live in Kingston, New York. Um, he came from Guyana, but um, has spent most of his, his working career as an artist in, um, Canada and the United States. And this is a this is a mixed media piece which contains photographs and line drawing and uh, um, collage work. And Andrew Light, besides making works like this, um, he's become very well known for his three-dimensional um, large scale objects, which we, um, which we did show in a one person exhibition a number of years ago. So um, this is a great work to actually come and look at in detail because there's so much mystery about the work that you discover when you're standing there, or I should say encounter when you're standing there. So this work is by Sandow Burke, who is a California-based artist who spent a great deal of time in the Hudson Valley studying classical Hudson River School techniques, which he fuses with um, contemporary imagery. Um, in 2002, he produced a series called Prisonation, and this is one of the works in that series. He focused on landscapes in California and also in the Hudson Valley, where or in New York State, I should say, where um, maximum security prisons were being built. And in New York between 1997 and 2000, there were um, 10 supermax prison, supermax facilities which were built. And then we already had one, so it made 11. And he was examining how this change changes the landscape. So if you look in the background, you can see um, the maximum security prison. And this particular painting is based on one by Asher Duran. And so he studied Duran and then added the prison to the landscape and 
I think these are just really interesting photos when you think about how, you know, landscapes change, you know, throughout the decades. And he spent a great deal of time studying um, Hudson River School artists. Yeah, I think one of the exciting parts about viewing this work for many people is that when they walk up to it, and it's also framed like a typical Hudson River School mm -hmm. painting with the, uh, you know, with the big gold frame. And when you walk up to it and you begin to look at it, your initial reaction is, oh, it's a 19th century Hudson River School painting, like Amy said. But then the, um, the shock comes when you look deeper into the painting and you see what appears to be a prison. And then you look over at the right hand side and you see electrical wires or transformer wires. And all of a sudden it's no longer a 19th century painting. It's, it's something else. And that's what's really neat about his work. They become something else. So I also want to include some um, images of the exhibition, some um, stills of it. Mm -hmm. So we have a Judy Pfaff in the background, and then we have some wonderful additions of um, Grace Wapner sculptures. And then in the background, we also have um, some um, French prints. We have a Matisse, a Pizarro, and a Renoir. Yeah, I just, Amy, if you want to just go back for a second, one thing I wanted to mention is that for any curator, uh, it's a challenge to lay out an exhibition. But for Amy and I, this exhibition was a real challenge because we had so many diverse works. There was not, the, the only theme was celebrating the Dorsky's 20 years and gifts and promise gifts. And that was a the theme. But as you probably can tell, there were so, there are so many different artworks and ways artists interpret interpret the world that it was a real challenge for us to uh, try to put this exhibition together to make it flow and to make it um, and make it work and um, I, I think we did a good job of course I'm prejudiced because I'm part of the part of the part of the uh, curator team but it was a good challenge for us and I, but I think it worked in the end So Sydney Cash, um, Sydney Cash is local. You might, some of you, if you're from New Paltz, might know Sydney Cash. Um, he uh, has lived in New Paltz for many, many years, but he is internationally known as a glass artist. Um, today, he also is making glass jewelry, but um, he actually built his career on not only glass pieces like this, but incredible glass installations that he would do in abandoned um, windows of department stores. And we are very fortunate that um, his wife, Julia Cash, um, class of 1975 at New Paltz, she's an alum, donated this piece by her husband to us to celebrate our, our 20th anniversary. It's kind of hard to see from the image what is going on here, but when you come to the museum, which I know you all will do, when you stand in front of here, this becomes almost, it's, it's like liquid glass. It's like running chocolate. It's just a lot of different ways that he uses glass. And it's quite an incredible piece. And like I said, his work is in the Corning Museum of Glass in Corning, New York. And it's, his work is included also in international um, museums as well. So we're very pleased to be able to uh, showcase and have a work by, by him, a very contemporary um, glass artist. So this portrait is by Edward Speaker, who in 1936 was Esquire named him America's most important living portraitist. However, he fell out over the years, he, he became less and less well known and he sort of his uh, works fell out of fashion. But over the past two decades, more and more scholars were studying his artwork. And this portrait was painted in 1947 and it's titled A Portrait of Martha. And it's unknown who Martha is. He painted both um, high society women and he also painted locals in Woodstock. So her identity remains a mystery, but we're very lucky that we were able to receive um, this wonderful portrait. And it would be interesting to, to, you know, to find out like who she is and whether she was you know, also living in the Woodstock area at the time. Um, and this was part of a small collection of um, Woodstock paintings, which were donated for the 20th anniversary. You know, one of the interesting things that Amy and I certainly know, um, and if you're an art historian, you might know this too, there's a lot of investigative work that goes on 
as an art historian. And that's really exciting too. Like Amy said, we don't know who this person is, but maybe someday we'll discover it. And that's one of the beauties of, um, uh, of being an art historian is you know some, but you there's a lot you don't know. And the, uh, the search is always great. So this is a work by Mark Hogan Camp, um, a Kingston based artist, and he um, is known for um, using dolls as um, the subjects of his photographs. And I'm not sure, I can't remember what year it was, but unfortunately he suffered a traumatic brain injury when he was leaving a, a bar in Kingston. Um, he had been attacked viciously by I believe three men. And during the healing process, he created um, a fictitious town in Belgium where he was a World War II fighter pilot and he would act out different narratives using dolls. And this is, you know, a fine example. In fact, the, the, word, the first time I walked by this, I actually didn't realize um, it was, it wasn't a person. I thought it, I walked by quickly and I thought it actually was um, a person sitting in a, in a car. Um, his works are, they're just very human-like and he does the photography himself. Um, and this also was a movie, um, his story became a movie um, a few years ago um, starring Steve Carell. So it's definitely received quite a bit of, he's received quite a bit of media attention over the um, past few years. And he, you know, this, his whole process, he's a local artist, so his whole process has been within the Hudson Valley. And so he's a very interesting artist to study and to, um, you know, learn about his methods. Mm -hmm. I guess in his backyard in Kingston, um, I haven't been there, but um, he's created a, this village, this incredible miniature village. And I don't remember to what scale, but it's to a certain scale. And the photographs that he produces, as Amy said, are, you know, they, they, they border on being realistic in a sense that he's using real people, but only dolls, mannequins, whatever. So again, there's so much work that goes into preparing um, the scene before he photographs it. And I think that's really something very contemporary that now today in the world of photography, the photograph is only one small part of the entire process. And Mark Hogenkamp is a great example because he will spend so much time creating his scenes that the only end result or the only lasting memory is just that photograph, which doesn't take that long to take. So again, this is very contemporary where the photograph is only one small part of the entire process today. So I want to show another view of the mm -hmm. gallery. We are also lucky enough to receive some, um, mm -hmm. some Chinese pottery, which you can see in the foreground. Um, the French Prince. Um, I guess talk what, a little bit about the. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll talk about the the, the boar, uh, <clears throat> the figure in the front, which I which I really love. Um, as you can see from the date, is very early, um, two hundred and sixty-five to three hundred and seventeen. Um, it is a Chinese piece. Um, again like with all the works in this exhibition, we are very fortunate to have this donated to us. This was probably a figure that was carved for a wealthy Chinese family. Most likely it was put into a tomb um, because the boar, as you see here, is quite ferocious. Um, notice its, it, it, its mouth with, it, with its teeth. Um, notice the position that it's in. It almost looks like it's going to attack someone. And most likely this was a burial piece. It was put into a tomb of, again, a wealthy Chinese individual to help guide the spirit, like the Egyptians did in other cultures, guide the spirit of the deceased to the next life. And this would act like a, like, like a form of protection to make sure that the, the spirit of the deceased got to that next point. So it's really a, a great piece. And it's, not that large, but we really love it. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great piece.
So this work is by the artist Willie Cole, um, Sunbeam Male Ceremonial. And Willie Cole is a New Jersey based artist who has also gained quite a bit of um, prominence over the past, um, I would say two decades. And he, he is, he, in this work, he is, um, it's a self portrait and he's sort of um, satirizing early anthropologi anthropological texts. Um, at the bottom, you can see um, where it says figures th three and four, um, and then sun sunbeam male ceremonial. So he, in New Jersey, um, he lived in a loft where it used to be an iron factory. And he was inspired by the scorch marks on the floor. And there are lots of different pieces left behind by the former factory workers. So they had, he had lots of different irons and um, ironing boards. So those are two, um, two things that show up in many of his works. So he dresses himself up with the, um, the iron in a, in a way that's supposed to, you know, look like he's wearing ceremonial dress. And he also studies the iron um, and the ironing board because his grandmother and his great grandmother were seamstresses and they had also, you know, been working in factories. So this was kind of a big part of, of his identity. And so he, through his photography, he often explores um, his connection with African-American history, as well as his own identity and his family. And um, I thought it was clever calling it sunbeam mail since it's based on the sunbeam iron. Here's a work by Osi Audu, um, and Osi is again a local artist, but he does have international, um, he is recognized internationally. He lives in Hurley, New York, um, but he does show his work um, not only in the United States, but around the world. Um, he was born in Nigeria. Um, he was very much influenced um, in this series that he did from um, different tribal hairstyles. And it's very abstract, and this is um, and very, very much like precisionist painting in a way, although it's a little different. But the work is so precisely and beautifully painted. Um, but again, he's dealing with his his past, his history, his connection to the past, um, and how it influences his future. So again, it's a it's a great work that the artist donated to us to celebrate our 20th. And when you come to the exhibition, you need to spend time looking at this because like I said, it's so beautifully painted. Um, it's just precise. There's nothing out of place here. And again, a very abstract view of him. <laughs> so when you come to the exhibition, um, one of one one thing that we did was we took we put together different um, archival materials that we've collected um, throughout the past 20 years. And so there are different um, newspaper clippings and some letters, drawings, um, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the architecture drawings. Yeah, over on the um, over on the left hand side, um, you, you probably notice some sketches and these are original sketches that the architect made on a piece of note paper when the discussion was first presented to this architect about building a museum and like any architect he took out a pad of paper he made some really rough sketches and said well we could do this or we could do that and when you look at them today those rough sketches really <laughs> did translate into the way the museum looks today so it's it's really neat to, to look at those and think about you know, this, this really quick one-off that he did, but he really captured the essence of how the museum um, was formally designed in the end and how it turned out. Um, so it's a great kind of um, look at the, um, at the, at the beginnings, um, with, as Amy said, newspaper articles. I think a lot of the fun for us was to go through these archives and, and to pick out things, and that was, probably as much fun as putting this all together because you never know what you're going to discover in those dusty boxes and archives. So we pulled out a selection, as Amy said, of, of different things that kind of mark the beginnings of the museum. I think that's the end of that. Uh, that's the end of the um, presentation of the PowerPoint. 
you have any questions, we'd love to, to answer them. Can I ask Wayne um, to reflect a little bit? I mean, you've been here prior to the founding of the museum. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit about how the growth has, you know, occurred. Just are there things that you've been surprised by, or you know, I've just a little bit of a reflection on on your time mm -hmm. watching the the Dorsky move from the College Art Gallery into this museum. Sure. Well, when I started here, it was hard, it's hard to believe now. It's twenty three years. So I started here when we were still the College Art Gallery. Um, we were a, a two-room gallery and we had carpet on the walls, which was very popular in the 1960s, but the, it had stained so bad, it was really so ugly. Um, but that didn't turn me away because I knew that the museum was coming. Um, you know, for me being here this long, it's been exciting to see the changes and the growth in the museum. It's been exciting to see the generosity of others who have donated artworks to us, um, who have helped us out when we called out for help. Um, it's exciting to see how the university campus has accepted us and how students are coming more and more to the museum and how faculty are using us more and more. How visitors, not only from the Hudson Valley, but from beyond continue to come and our attendance continues to grow. So that for me is really exciting because we started with this, this core of an idea, the Dorsky Museum. And today, like I said, we are the second largest museum in the SUNY system, but we're one of the leading museums in the Hudson Valley and beyond. And that to me is really exciting to watch all that happen um, because it worked. And that was Sam Dorsky's um, original, um, original wish along with Neil Traeger, the, um, the, the founding director of the museum. And together they both had this idea that we can take this little gallery that's on campus and really make it into something special. And they did, and that's what's so great. Wonderful. Does anybody else have questions? Like I said, I encourage you all to come to the um, to the exhibition. You know, certainly a, a Zoom talk is great, and I think it's exciting that we've been able to move into this new technology. But again, there's nothing like actually seeing the work in person. So, this is good for all of you who have attended today because you've gotten some inside information, right, that other people did not get. But you really need to come and and, and visit us in person. And there's lots of, uh, lots of other things to see too when you're here. And I want to, um, we've got some thank yous. Janice says, great job, Barry. Says, thank you, Wayne and Amy. I wanna let everybody know um, for some more insight, um, we talked, you heard us sort of be very thankful to the donors of work to the collection. And it's not just art collectors, uh, but also artists hmm, right. for a little bit more insight into why people chose the Dorsky as a place to donate work. We have a program with Amy and Wayne this Friday at 2 p.m. They'll be joined by Ward Mintz, who's the chair of our advisory board, Arthur Anderson, who's the chair of our exhibitions committee, O.C. Awudu and Grace Wachner, who are both artists who've donated work that's in this exhibition. So it'll be a nice way to sort of hear from some of the people who make up the Dorsky um, and our family. Um, so um, thank you, Linda. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, there is a link, Barry. It is on our website. I can also pop it right into the chat for you so you could register right now. Um, um, but yeah, thank you, Amy and Wayne. I love seeing this exhibition. It's something that's so wonderful to me about the show is that it really, um, it gives you an idea of just how expansive and kind of bonkers our collection is. Mm -hmm. You know, we, <laughs> it's, it's really varied. I mean, it's so wonderful to have, um, and I just put the link in the chat for that for registration. Uh, for that Friday event, but it's so wonderful to have such a range of objects to share with our students and to enhance their learning and also to share with the public who walk through the door. Um, 
it's a super bonkers show. I mean, it's like, where else are you going to see a Cindy Sherman, like, you know, cat a corner from a Cezanne print, you know, it's super bonkers. It's so much fun to see. So I really do encourage you all to come out and, and do this and see it in person. And, and one thank thing I, you. Just wanna, I just want to say one more thing too. Uh -huh. Again, Zach, what you brought up about reflecting. When I started here, the permanent collection was probably around 2,000 objects. And today we're really getting so close to 7,000. And again, we've purchased so little because our, our, our acquisitions fund is not that big. So again, the generosity of others, which I admire every single day, that people are so willing to give us artwork that's special to them, knowing that it will be preserved for the future and that we will be able to use it for education, for entertainment and so on. So. That's really great. And what Wayne doesn't know is that he's not allowed to leave the museum until we hit 10,000 objects. <laughs> okay. He doesn't he, he doesn't know that I we added that in the contract. Okay, I didn't realize that. But you know, <laughs> you know, I just want to say something really kind of I think it's kind of funny because I do teach also. And when I began teaching so so many years ago, the students and I were very close in age, and today I can be their father, which is really scary. But now I say that when I become their grandfather, it's time to retire. So I'll say that, I'll say that also about the museum. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, oh man, well, uh, thanks everybody for coming today. Again, thank you, Wayne and Amy. Great job, great job on the show. And we hope that, that you'll join us on Friday for more insight into this exhibition and into celebrating 20 years of the Dorsky. And thank you all for being people of the Dorsky. We celebrate you uh, at this milestone as well. Um, thank you, Zach, for putting this together. Thank you so much. You're the brains behind the operation. <laughs> the heart, maybe. <laughs> uh, or yeah. the voice the, the, that won't shut up. Are you looking for our contact information or? I can, you know, I can, um, here, I'm going to stop a recording. Thanks, y'all.